Hello, my friends. Always wonderful to get to spend time with you. Question for you. How do you respond when God speaks? All of us pray and we want God to speak to us, but it's hard sometimes to actually respond when he does speak because sometimes the thing God tells us are not the things that we want him to tell us or, or there's implications in what he says that might be hard or difficult. I was meeting with a friend and I was talking to her. She's been praying and asking God about something in her life. And she says, every time I pray, God answers and he shows me this and that, but I still haven't done anything about it and I don't know why. I feel stuck. Well, we're gonna kind of process that a little bit. How should we respond when God speaks to us, when he talks to us? You see, last week we talked a little bit about Zachariah and how he prayed this prayer with his wife probably for years about having a baby. And after he'd given up hope, God answers his prayers and God meets him even in his disbelief. And so part of learning to lean on God is understanding God's timing is perfect and his ways are perfect. But then when God actually shows up to us, we have a response in the next steps and we need to respond to God. And so we're gonna look at what that looks like a little bit today by looking at Mary and Joseph and their story. So before we do, will you bow your heads with me as we pray? Our kind, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you that you are here and that you are God. We thank you that you love us so much and that you are actively engaged in each one of our lives. I thank you that you are present and at work and um, always around each one of us and that you are paying attention to the nitty gritty details, the nuances of things. Lord, I thank you we can trust you for that. So Lord, as we are diving into your word today, we pray that you will speak, that we will hear your voice. And Lord, teach us how to respond and how to obey. Help us to love you more and learn to lean on you just a little bit more today. In your name we pray. Amen. The Jewish girls would pray that maybe they would get the honor of being the mother of the Messiah. And the Jews as a whole would be praying for the Messiah to come. They wanted him to come and to overthrow the Romans and to set up his kingdom here on earth. Well, I'm not sure when Gabriel actually shows up to Mary. Mary maybe she was planning her wedding because she just had got engaged and maybe she was having fun like that or maybe it was in her worship time when she's spending time with God. And maybe she'd actually prayed, you know, God, if you see fit, let me be the mother of the Messiah. I don't know what happens in the Bible doesn't tell us, but I can only imagine how Mary feels when all of a sudden the room is aglow and here is an angel standing in front of her. And he says, greetings, Mary. Hi, you are highly favored and God is with you. I absolutely love how the angel starts this. He says, you're highly favored. You know, something good has happened. God is going to give you a lot of favor and he is with you. You see, God is with each and every one of us, but the fact that God is with Mary means that Mary has a relationship where she is walking with God. And so there's a choice and the way the angel greets her lets us know that she is in relationship with God. She is in connection with him and open to him. And so that's how the angel starts this interaction. I want us to actually read it in Luke. Go turn with me to Luke chapter one. We're gonna start reading in verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of the King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings favored woman, the Lord is with you. There's a few things we need to pay attention to in this verse. First of all, it says that Mary was engaged. Being engaged was a little bit different back then than it is now because it was very serious. If you were engaged, you were basically married already, but the ceremony hadn't taken place and you weren't living together yet. You didn't live together until the ceremony had taken place. Unlike today where you can be engaged and just break an engagement and there's nothing legal about it, back then in order to break an engagement, you actually had to get a divorce. It was a very serious thing. So Mary's engaged and probably planning her wedding. And it also tells us that she's a virgin. And this is important to understand because the prophecies of the Messiah say that he was gonna be born of a virgin. And so here, this is what we learn about Mary. And then the angel says, greeting favored one. Now, when you think of favored, what stands out to you? What pops into your head? For me, it's like, oh, I'm gonna get something really awesome. This is gonna be amazing. I don't often think of hardships or difficult time. But as I think about favored from God's perspective, and as we look at the story of Mary, being favored included the law, the awesome and amazing part. She got to be the mother of the Messiah, but it also included a lot of hardships. 
And so when favor comes with pros and cons, how do you respond to it? When God shows up and says, hey, you're favored, I have something awesome for you, but it doesn't just mean everything's gonna be easy and perfect, that it's gonna be hard and uncomfortable, how do you respond? Well, let's continue reading Mary's story and see what happens. In verse 29, it tells us that Mary's confused and disturbed. And honestly, I might be too. What? I don't know what's going on. What's happening here? And it says, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. And so the angel pipes up. So I can imagine Mary sitting there going, uh, ah, uh, what? And so the angel's like, just let me fill this in for you. He's like, here, let me tell you why I'm here, Mary. This is what's going to happen. In verse 30 says, don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He'll be very great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David, and he will reign over Israel's kingdom. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can that happen? I'm a virgin. The angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth, who has become pregnant in her old age, people used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month for nothing is impossible with God. All right. So here's what the angel says. The angel shows up and says, congratulations, Mary. God has chosen you to have a baby. And she could have been thinking, yeah, of course I'm going to have a baby. I'm about to get married. Of course, that's what women do. And, but the angel continues on a little bit. He says, yeah, you're going to have a son and you're to name him Jesus. And he's going to take the throne of his ancestor, David. And the fact that Mary asked the question, how can this happen? Let's us know that she knows that this baby isn't going to come by normal means, that this baby isn't going to be somebody normal because he's going to have the throne of his ancestor, David. And those are words pointing to the prophecies of the Messiah. That's what, and so I can imagine her brain starts, things start clicking together and there's some things that are happening. As she's listening to the angel, she's like, yeah, of course I'm going to have a baby. I'm about to get married. That's of course, that's what going to happen. That's what naturally happens. No, she understands the angel's talking about more. Um, Zachariah, when the angel had come to him last week, said, well, how will I know this will happen? And because of his doubt and because God answered his prayer, he wanted a sign. God allows him to be silent until John is born. And this proves to Zachariah what he asked for. Mary asks a different question. Her question is logistical. She's like, okay, so there, we're talking about someone different. We're talking about something different. I'm not just going to have a baby that I know that can normally happen. So how is this going to happen? I don't understand. Is it going to happen with Joseph or is it going to happen a different way? And she looks at the angel and asks this question. And the angel says, okay, the Holy Spirit's going to come on you and the Most High is going to overshadow you and the baby to be born will be called the Son of God. He's saying the baby you're about to have is going to be a miracle. He is going to be God's son. He is going to be the Messiah. And then the angel says, and guess what? Just to let you know that nothing is impossible with God, you know your cousin Elizabeth, who's really old? Well, she's in her sixth month. She is pregnant because nothing is impossible with God. Now, I want us to pause for a minute and to stop and consider um, the implications of God showing up and talking to Mary. Mary is engaged, she is a virgin, and so she's promised, and the angel has just told her, congratulations, you get to be the mother of God. And on the outset, that looks absolutely amazing, but there are a lot of things that go along with this. She's gonna get pregnant, and God has just said that Joseph is not gonna be part of that process. When she lands up and ends up pregnant, what is going to happen? How is he going to respond? What is everyone else going to think about her? You know, if you got caught sleeping with somebody outside of marriage, you were supposed to be stoned to death. At the least, you could be shamed and the rumors and stuff that are going to go around. There's a lot of implications to this. She could be alone and a single mother and there's so much going on. When the angel shows up to her and says, Mary, guess what? You are highly favored. It comes with 
a lot of uncomfortable things. Now, this is a decision that many of us wouldn't take lightly. Okay, it would be awesome to be the mother of God, but this is going to be hard. What if I mess up? What if I'm a bad mom and I don't teach him right and then he messes up and he doesn't, he isn't able to save the world? Or what are people going to think about me? Or, you know, what is Joseph going to think? Are we still going to get married? There's lots of things that could have been going through our head and implications. But what I love about Mary is it doesn't appear that she needs to pause at all. It doesn't appear that she needs to weigh the options and she doesn't have more questions because what she immediately says in verse 38, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. So the angel comes and says, Mary, you are favored. God is with you. He is asking you to be the mother of the Messiah and the Holy Spirit's going to come on you. And Mary doesn't say, but it's going to be hard and it's going to be difficult. And what if I mess up? She doesn't have all the doubts. And so many times when God tells us to do something, we talk ourselves out of being obedient to God or responding yes to God because of how hard it is. And we forget that God will never ask us to do something that he is not going to enable us to do. That he's not going to walk with us and help us through so that we are able to accomplish it, things. We are told that God is working in us to give us the desire and the power to do what pleases him. But too many times we feel like we have to know how to do it and we have to have it all figured out. And so what Mary does is says, I I'm the Lord's servant. May it happen to me exactly as you said, God. I am all in, 100% all in. And that is just astounding to me. It is amazing. Well, she is all in, but she's not the only person that this impacts and this affects. In Matthew, we learned kind of about the birth of Jesus from Joseph's perspective. And so I want us to turn over to Matthew chapter 1. And I want us to read a little bit there and see how Joseph responds. Because I imagine after all this goes down, Mary's excited and she's thrilled. And then the questions start swirling and all the different things. I'm not really sure how Joseph finds out because we don't know. But here's what happens in Matthew chapter 1. We're going to start reading in verse 18. It says, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, see both gospels mention it's while she's engaged, but she's still a virgin that all this happens. Um, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. They Both gospels also mention that this is a miracle. God is in this. Joseph, her fiance, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. All right. So what's happening here? I can only imagine after Mary has this conversation with the angel, she's so excited and she's like, God, you're amazing. But then reality sets in and this is gonna happen. And I don't know when she knows she's pregnant, but and I'm not sure how she knew it all happened, but she knew she was pregnant and she knew that it was gonna come out and she knew she had to tell Joseph. Can you imagine having that conversation? Hey, Joseph, I want you to know how much I love you and I'm really looking forward to getting married and I'm really excited about our wedding and I'm really excited, but I have to, I have, we have to talk. Can we have a talk? I don't know how Joseph feels about this. They're engaged and Mary sits him down and I'm sure when she asked to have a talk, it was like, oh, what's she going to say? What's going to happen here? And then Joseph is sitting there and Mary's like, I want you to know I'm pregnant, but don't worry, I didn't cheat on you. I promise I didn't cheat on you. And I can imagine that the voices are just like, it, it kind of fades out and the room begins to pulse for Joseph. What do you mean you're pregnant? Who's the father? Well, Joseph, that's what I'm trying to tell you. It's God who's the father. And, you know, I, you know, the Holy Spirit showed up to me, an angel showed up to me, and he told me that I get to be the mother of the Messiah and that the Holy Spirit is going to come on me and that I would be pregnant. And so I'm pregnant, but I didn't cheat on you. And I like this, we get to be the parents of the Messiah. It tells us in Matthew that Joseph is a good man. He's a God fearing man. But when he hears this, the implication is, is he can't wrap his head around this. What in the world? Like, 
how, like, really, Mary? Uh, the Holy Spirit got you pregnant? That's what you're going to tell me? You're not just going to own up to what you did? But at the same time, he cares enough about her that he doesn't want to disgrace her publicly. He doesn't want to drag her through the thing. But he also can't go forward with the marriage. He can't He can't be with someone who's going to cheat on him. He Like, how can he? This is just horrible. He is trying to figure out how to divorce her quietly. How would you feel if you're Mary? And God has said, you're highly favored and God is with you and you've had to have a conversation and now your fiance is trying to figure out how to get out of the marriage. And then how would you feel if you were Joseph and Mary showed up to you and said, hey, hey Joseph, just want to tell you I'm pregnant, but I didn't cheat on you, I promise. Like, like both of them are in this horrible situation. It's really hard. So what do they do next? Well, it tells us in verse 20 that Joseph considers this. He's considering how to break up the marriage. When it talks about Joseph considers this, it, it implies that it's a pondering, that he takes time, that this isn't an instant decision. So what, what does Mary do during this time? I want us to flip back to Luke, Luke chapter one. It jumps in in verse um, 39, a few days after angel Gabriel shows up to Mary, it says a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea to the town where Zachariah lived. Why would Mary immediately a few days after the angel Gabriel showed up to her go visit Zachariah and Elizabeth? I think it's because she had a conversation with Joseph. I think she had a conversation with Joseph and she knew Joseph was going to try to break the engagement. And I think she was broken. And I think she was horribly upset and I think she needed comfort and the angel had told her that God had done something amazing and impossible for her cousin Elizabeth and I think she needed to be with someone who was also going through something beyond their wildest imagination who was having a hard time and a great time all at the same time and so a few days after the angel shows up to her while Joseph is considering what to do how he can break the engagement quietly Mary goes off to the hill country to be with Zachariah and Elizabeth. And so here's what happens um, in verse 39, Luke 1, 39. A few days later, Mary hurried off to the hill country of Judea to the town where Zachariah and Elizabeth lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leapt within her and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed, Mary, God has blessed you above women and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. Mary, probably looking for encouragement and comfort, has gone to the right place. You see, Gabriel knew what he was doing when he pointed Mary to Elizabeth and told her that she was going through something miraculous too. And God knew that as Mary accepted this, this calling to live as the mother of the Messiah, that it was going to be hard and she was going to need people to walk with. And so God pointed her to Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth gets there, the Holy Spirit fills Elizabeth. And before Mary says anything, Elizabeth says, why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should come? And the baby has leapt for joy. And she says, you are blessed. Elizabeth pronounces a blessing and she tells her before Mary has can say anything. You are blessed because you believed. She had learned from her husband who had doubted um, and now is quiet and Zachariah's probably there, can't hear, can't speak or do anything, just watching these two ladies have this little party. Elizabeth's like, you are blessed because you believed. Yeah, Mary believed, but that didn't mean that being a favorite and responding to God's call was easy. In fact, she's still in limbo, not sure what's going to happen to her next. There's all sorts of implications. She could be put to death for cheating on her husband. She, The very least, she could be divorced and ha be a single mother and live with the stigma. People could question and wonder who she is and how she could be so horrible. And like she might be alone. And there's lots of things. But yet still, when she goes to Elizabeth, God speaks again. And he speaks through Elizabeth and he says, no, you are blessed. You are favored and God is with you. 
And so how does Mary respond to Elizabeth? In verse 46, Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl. From now on, generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one is holy. He has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. He has brought down the princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful, for he has made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back to her own home. So how does Mary respond? Mary doesn't complain. She never once complains about all that's going on. She never once complains about how hard it is or everything that's happening with Joseph. And I'm sure she told Elizabeth, but what she starts with is praise, that I am blessed, that God saw me and I know that I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I've done nothing to deserve his favor, that God saw me and has given me this honor. And this honor is not just for me, it's for everybody, that God remembers his people and his covenant and that through me, the world will be blessed through the Messiah. Mary has this understanding that she's part of something bigger. And as she is in the presence of Elizabeth, and as she's watching this miracle happen, her resolve and her um, fortitude and her trust and her praise, I believe, just continues to grow in her. She stays with Elizabeth for three more months. Gabriel showed up to Mary when Elizabeth was six months pregnant, and Mary stays with Elizabeth for three more months most likely until John the Baptist was born. And Mary got to witness this. As Mary gets to see all these things and gets to see how God has given favor to Elizabeth and Zachariah and how God is working there, she also is able to trust in her relationship and her resolve and her strength and her courage is strengthened. And she can go back to her hard situation. She can go back to Joseph. And so it says after three months, Mary doesn't just choose to move in with Zachariah and Elizabeth. She doesn't just stay there. She doesn't run away from the problem, but she goes for the support that she needs. And she goes until her relationship and her resolve with God is, is strengthened and secure. And she is able to praise God in spite of the difficulty. And then she goes back. Let's go back to Matthew chapter one and verse 20. It says, well, we'll start in verse 19. Joseph, her fiance, was a good man and he didn't want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly as he considered this. So there's this considering that Joseph's doing. And I believe it's while Mary is gone for three months, he's, you know, had this bombshell news that his fiance has cheated on him and is now pregnant, but he still cares about her enough that he doesn't want to disgrace her. He's still, he's not trying to do an eye for an eye. He's not trying to get even, but he just can't be like, he just can't continue the marriage like that. Just how could he do that? So he's pondering this and trying to figure it out. And I believe he's wrestling. And you see, my friends, sometimes when God has a call on our life, there's this wrestling process. You know, God, what do I do? And what do I do? And the wrestling sometimes comes before God tells us what to do. And sometimes it comes after God tells us to do. You see, with Mary, the angel shows up. She accepts it right away. But then there's this processing. She needs to go to Elizabeth for courage and support. Joseph, on the other hand, hears about Mary's story, about the angel showing up, and it has implications for him, and he's not sure he believes her. Now he wants to divorce her, and he's processing. And so in verse 20, it says, As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Can you imagine having that dream? Joseph's been pondering and wrestling and maybe for three months while Mary's gone. Pondering, what, what do I do with all of this? And then while he's pondering, while he's praying, while he's, while he's trying to make the best decision, while he's weighing the odds, God shows up. 
You know, sometimes in our confusion, we feel like our prayers are hitting the ceiling, but we have to understand that the Holy Spirit can translate our prayers. Paul tells us this, that when we utter groans and words that cannot be expressed, that the Holy Spirit translates those to God. And so Joseph in his pain and in his struggle and in his agony, as he's pondering what to do next, he's praying. Because Joseph is a good man, he's a righteous man, he loves God. And so as he is wrestling with this, God hears him and meets him there. And God sends him a dream. And in the dream, he is told, no, 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 you need to marry Mary. You know, she what she said was true. She wasn't lying. She wasn't making it up. She is pregnant with a boy. You're to name him Jesus. And he's the Holy Spirit's baby. He is going to be called the Son of the Most High. He is the Messiah. Joseph, get up and, and don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Now, there's a lot of implications for Joseph, too. If he marries Mary, now there's still going to be rumors that she had cheated on him. People would know that she, when she comes back from visiting Elizabeth, she's going to be at least three months pregnant. And, you know, probably showing people would have noticed. Then the rumors could start, oh, maybe Joseph and Mary, you know, had a fling before they were supposed to get married. And that's why they're getting married. Or maybe Mary cheated on him. Or, you know, I wonder why he didn't divorce her. Maybe, and all the rumors could fly around and all the different things would go on. There could be, you know, marks against Joseph's good name and Mary's good name. It would be hard. How could he be the father of the Messiah? What if he did something wrong? And there's lots of things that could be going through Joseph's head. But Joseph has been considering, and he's been considering for a while, probably three months. Um, but the considering, the original language lets us know that it's a, it was a process that he's been wrestling with this. What happens once he has the dream? In verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born and Joseph named him Jesus. So what does he do? When he wakes up, and it implies that when he woke up that day, he went and married Mary that day. That means that Mary had probably just gotten back from visiting Elizabeth and Zachariah. And I can imagine she's been in turmoil and she gets a knock at the door and it's Joseph. And I can only imagine what's going through her head thinking, oh no, maybe he's come to, you know, just lay the hammer down. We're done, Mary. This is how it's going to happen. Just want to know, want you to know I'm not going to see you again and blah, blah, blah. But instead, as the door opens, he says, come on, Mary, let's go. We're doing it today. We're getting married today. I had a dream last night and God told me that you have the mother of the Messiah and we're going to do this. It's going to be hard, but we're going to do this together and it's going to be awesome. And you know what? I'm going to do everything to protect you and take care of you. And we're not going to live as husband and wife until after the baby's born. I don't want anyone to think that I had anything to do with this because this is a God thing. Mary, we're going to do this. That day after the dream, Joseph doesn't have to consider anymore. He doesn't have to ponder anymore. And just like Mary, when she knew God was talking, she responded right away. So does Joseph. And you see, I think that's why God called them to be the mother of Jesus. Because even though it was hard, and even though there's so many things going on, they had the type of trust in God that despite what God was asking them to do, knowing that it was going to be difficult, knowing that it would be painful in ways, knowing that it wasn't always going to be easy, they trusted God enough to know that saying yes was the only answer. Saying, okay, God, I trust you, and we'll do this. We're all in. Let's, let, let's go. Let's go. Um, praise God that you chose me in spite of how hard it's going to be or how difficult it would be. God, thank you. And let's do this. And so Joseph takes Mary that day and he marries her. My friends, the story is so powerful. And it just it's just another insight as we learn to lean on Jesus. We need to learn that as we pray, God will respond to us. He will answer us. And oftentimes what he tells us next makes us feel uncomfortable or we're not sure because we don't have it all figured out. But one of the things that I am learning from this story is when God says something, I need to trust God knows what he's doing, that God has a bigger plan and that he will work out the details. Not that it's always going to be easy because God said it, but if God told me to do it, I'm going to do it. And that's going to be enough. I need to respond. Yes. I need to have the same servant mentality that Joseph and Mary both had when they knew God was speaking. 
Mary knows immediately God is speaking. It takes Joseph a processing time to know God is speaking. And both of them are okay. Sometimes I need to wrestle with God and wrestle with the situation. And sometimes I will immediately know. But when I know, I need to respond in obedience. My friends, what about you? What is God saying to you as we've processed through Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1, the story of Mary and Joseph, and them responding to God and them hearing God speak, and how they responded to God's call on their lives? What did God say to you? I'd love to know. Please grab your connection cards and let me know. You can do that by texting the letter CC to 301-321-8848. And let me know, what did God say to you as we process this passage? What really stood out to you? What struck you struck a chord in your mind? And secondly, how are you going to respond to God? Just like Mary and Joseph, God always wants a response. As we engage with him in his word, and the reason that we study together and we process the word is because God is speaking and he wants us to respond. And so how are you going to respond to God? And lastly, how can we pray for you? Because we need each other on this journey. Let me pray for you right now. Our kind, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you that you are God and that you are here. Lord, I thank you that you have a call on our lives. You have a call on my life and everyone's life within the sound of my voice. And Lord, I just pray that as um, you speak to us, whether it's through your word or through some other way, that we will be responsive like Joseph and Mary, that we'll respond, yes, Lord, may it happen to me exactly as you've said, that we won't try to talk ourselves out of it because of the hardship, because Lord, Mary and Joseph struggled in so many ways, and we will struggle too when we respond to your call, but that doesn't mean it's not you. And so Lord, I pray that you give us the courage and the boldness to respond, yes. Lord, I just pray that you bless each one of us today as we're learning to lean on you and to trust you. In your name we pray, amen. I want to thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We strongly believe that we need to respond to God and we're trying to learn how to be disciples and to have that relationship and to get to know God and respond and to live out those responses. So one of the ways that we do that is we process the passage together and we process the questions that we have. Maybe I brought something up, but I wasn't able to fully explain it to your liking. So join us today at 1130. We're going to process the same passages together live. You can join us in person at our building at 14595. Avion Parkway in Chantilly, Virginia, or you can join us on Zoom as we are also going to have our live interactive Zoom study um, at the same time where you'll get to be part of that conversation. So you can grab the Zoom links by texting the word study to 301-321-8848. I hope you'll join us and I look forward to studying with you very soon.